Welcome to day two of the Florida Chamber Insurance Summit. Yesterday, we had an excellent lineup of topics, including a breakdown of the 2020 elections, what it means for 2021, and how COVID-19 is impacting the economy and the state budget. We then took a crash course into the latest in the insurance marketplace, including an update on citizens property insurance and the Florida Hurricane Catastrophe Fund. And last but certainly not least, we covered auto glass AOB litigation, reinsurance trends and how lawsuit abuse in property insurance is driving up rates for all. If you missed yesterday's action or want to watch a segment again, check out the individual agenda tabs to view videos after they air. Hold on to your hats though, because Insurance Summit Day 2 starts now. Welcome to Day 2 of the Florida Chamber Insurance Summit. Stay with us all day for appearances from Chief Financial Officer Jimmy Petronis. Florida Insurance Commissioner David Altmeyer. Don't miss our legislative panel with members of the Florida legislature from around the state. And panel discussions about the importance of insurance in the state of Florida. And now here is your host for the day, Caitlin Murray. Good morning. My name is Caitlin Murray and I'm the Regional Vice President for the Southeast for the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Before we get started with today's very exciting program, it's important that I read the following antitrust statement. As participants in this meeting, we need to be mindful of the constraints of antitrust laws. There shall be no discussions of agreements or concerted actions that may restrain competition. This prohibition includes the exchange of information concerning individual prices, rates, coverages, market practices, claim settlement practices, or any other competitive aspect of an individual company's operation. Each participant is obligated to speak up immediately for the purpose of preventing any discussion falling outside these bounds. As I previously mentioned, we have a very exciting day two agenda at the Florida Chamber's annual insurance summit. First on the agenda, Carolyn Johnson will be moderating a panel of industry experts who will be discussing an extremely relevant topic, COVID-19's impact on insurance, liability, business interruption, and workers' compensation. Ms. Johnson is the Director of Business Economic Development and Innovation Policy with the Florida Chamber of Commerce. Please welcome Carolyn Johnson to introduce today's panelists. Hello and welcome to COVID-19's impact on insurance, where we will be discussing liability, business interruption, and workers' compensation. I am joined today by our panelists, William Large, President of the Florida Justice Reform Institute, David Langham, Deputy Chief Judge, Office of Judges of Compensation Claims, Mark Friedlander, Director of Corporate Communications with the Insurance Information Institute, and Aaron Collins, Vice President of State Affairs for the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Thank you for all being here today. Everyone here represents different perspectives as, at this table when it comes to insurance and COVID-19. How is the insurance industry responding to COVID-19? And what are some of the problems that the industry um, is facing because of this pandemic? Let me start with some good news here. Uh, the insurance industry has had a very strong response to the pandemic. And I'll give you some examples. For customers slash policyholders, the industry has provided $14 billion in premium relief in the terms of auto refunds and credits to, to auto accounts. This was based primarily on the fact of much less driving, especially during the, during the first few months of the pandemic, uh, to communities. Uh, charitable organizations that are part of insurance companies have provided $280 million to help local organizations fight the pandemic uh, on the ground level, you know, really helping the frontline workers. Uh, in terms of employment, more than 2.8 million 
People are currently employed in the insurance industry, and we've seen an increase in employment during the pandemic. In fact, the insurance industry is one of the few sectors where we've seen substantial job growth during the pandemic. We're talking about PNC, life, health, and the agent broker side. All four set major sectors of insurance have grown in terms of employment this year. And lastly, how the industry is responding in terms of the uniqueness of the pandemic, respecting social distancing, for example. You know, we've had so many hurricanes and severe weather events this year. So what the insurance industry has done in many cases is for the claims process, they've gone to drones, for example, to assess property losses. They're working with their policyholders and letting them upload images of property damage instead of being on site because once again, due to social distancing, trying to keep that level uh, strong. So a lot of steps, a lot of positive actions that the insurance industry has taken. Mark's points are, are all um, well taken, absolutely true. Uh, I think that in terms of challenges, they're somewhat related to those successes that, that Mark mentioned. You know, Servicing our policyholders is not easy to do uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic, especially at the beginning when we were all trying to figure out what to do and really how to interact in general. Uh, when you add to that the layer uh, that this is uh, one of the most highly regulated industries in the world, uh, you, you run into a natural challenge. And so uh, we spent quite a bit of time and continue to spend time uh, working with regulators to make sure that there were spaces uh, for insurers to be able to get to their policyholders and help their policyholders either from a virtual standpoint, uh, easing some red tape to help adjusters get in uh, in a way that, that was um, applicable during the time of pandemic. So there are a lot of these um, sort of strategies we undertook from an advocacy perspective to try to smooth out the process and, and get people connected with their, with their customers. And that's certainly been a challenge and I think continues to be a challenge, but um, it's also an opportunity. I mean, I think um, one of the things that will come out of this uh, is a conversation with regulators about what of those strategies uh, have worked really well and could become permanent. Uh, speed to market, speed to access to our customers are all things that benefit uh, the market and the consumers. So I think uh, even though they're challenges, they can turn into, into positive things. Judge Lingham, um, you know, we've discussed some of the challenges that COVID-19 has had on the insurance industry. I know you've been examining some of the data that's been issued by the Division of Workers' Comp on COVID-19 related workers' comp claims. What is the data showing? The impact is in, in multiple directions. We're seeing folks uh, with orthopedic injuries, with uh, other exposure injuries, who are experiencing difficulty with uh, the simple things from pre-COVID, transportation to and from doctors, uh, getting to a doctor's appointment. Uh, you talked about innovation. One of the great things we've seen come out of this, uh, this situation is the advent and, and really acceptance of telemedicine. We're seeing a lot more folks getting to doctor's offices over telephone links. And I think that's really positive for a lot of folks for follow-up. In terms of the hard numbers of what we're seeing in actual claims, uh, as of the end of August, we had about 17,653 lost time cases in Florida. By the end of September, that had jumped to uh, 21,221. So in one month, an increase of about 3,500 cases. Uh, these are workers from all, all aspects of the, of the spectrum of employment. Although early in this crisis, we saw a lot of claims in the airline industry, uh, that's, that's kind of fallen off in terms of the growth. And so we're really seeing it more in the other aspects. I think our division in Florida has done an excellent job of getting this data out and telling you what it looks like. Uh, but just in, in general numbers, uh, we've seen about $30 million paid out in uh, indemnity and medical benefits on COVID claims. Uh, about 65% of those claims I just told you about are, are recognized by the, the insurance agents or companies as closed claims. And we can view that as positively or negatively, folks. Uh, what does closed mean? It could mean they've been settled. Uh, it could mean that the benefits were paid and things have reasonably resolved and folks have gotten back to work. So I don't think we can put a whole lot of faith in, in the fact that those closed claims may not necessarily one day reopen. 
what have we seen in terms of severity? About 97% of those cases uh, have paid out less than $5,000. So these are not huge claims, most of them, uh, but that remaining 4% is a significant amount of money. And so we are having cases are, that are involved in what uh, folks are starting to call the long COVID or the big COVID. Uh, and that's cases that aren't about quarantine and testing. Those are cases that are about hospitalization and ventilation. Uh, unfortunately, folks, some of those cases have been about death. Uh, and certainly we're gonna see some claims about permanent lung and heart damage, maybe permanent total disability. One of the things that's really curious is it seems like carriers are picking an awful lot of these claims up. About 50% uh, about of the cases are being accepted in Florida. And with our 120 day rule that's in our statute, if they pick that up and pay anything and 120 days passes after that without them denying it, uh, those carriers have bought those cases for life. And it may be that they're buying cases on today's information that may look a whole lot different on tomorrow's information. So I, I think in a nutshell, that sort of encapsulates where we are numerically. Uh, it has been a serious situation, but I think personal opinion, I think Florida is handling it as well or better than any state workers compensation system out there. Aaron, you have the national perspective of what's happening in terms of workers comp and COVID-19. How have other states responded to workers compensation claims related to COVID-19? And is this something that Florida carrier carriers should be worried about? There, there are a wide variety uh, of proposals that either have been out there or accepted by uh, several states. Um, some have taken the approach like Florida of trying to provide some uh, presumption and expansion to first responders. Uh, there have been other examples where they have been very wide ranging. And so I think the question then becomes, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind about workers' compensation. One, I think it's important to keep in mind that these are all well-intentioned efforts, right? They, you know, these are all efforts by either a legislative body or an executive um, to try to help people. And certainly we are, are cognizant of that and recognize that. Um, so it's coming from a good place. But the thing that's important about workers' comp is that it only works as a system if it's utilized in the way that it was intended and for what it was intended. And workers' comp is meant for illness and injury that is peculiar to a particular job. And a, a disease of life like this, um, unless it comes through in the claims process, which is already contemplated that by the workers' comp system, that those two things meet in a nexus, then an ordinary disease of life is, is counter to the concept of what workers' comp is. And so the problem is if you add all of these presumptions onto the system, the system can't sustain it. Uh, so what we've seen is some states that either through bill or executive fiat have put in a presumption much broader uh, than just the frontline workers of the pandemic. We've seen things uh, extended to all essential workers, uh, which includes a whole lot of industries, um, you know, myself included. Uh, we've seen, um, language that arguably extends to all workers anywhere. Um, we've seen even within the language of some of those orders, some really loose uh, connective tissue in terms of what it means to uh, have a claim. So by way of example, uh, there is an executive order that the presumption was that if you had a doctor's note to pull you out of work, it was presumed that you have COVID and it was further presumed uh, that you got it from work and then further presumed uh, that then you have workers' comp coverage. Um, so again, well-intentioned effort, but what we're seeing is just um, an, an overly broad approach that puts uh, stress to the comp system that it can't sustain. William, um, you know, I've heard some concerns that having these presumptions in place and, um, you know, having a presumption that a workplace is dangerous or a business is dangerous could be problematic in terms of, you know, liability. Is this something that we should be concerned about? Yeah, Carolyn, thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely. A lot of the efforts in the last six months at liability reform addressed, first and foremost, tort liability 
but a few states, the end result was creating a presumption that if you got COVID, you got it at work. So I think there's a lesson there that if the business community tries to address some type of tort or civil liability COVID bill, that it makes sure that it stays in that lane and doesn't allow it to go into the lane of creating a presumption that um, would create further problems. So we saw that in New Jersey, we've seen that effort at least be tried in a few other states. So we wanna be very careful about any COVID-19 reforms that the business community works on. If it's presumed that someone contracted COVID-19 at work, what does that do to the market if losses from COVID are not included in the rate making for renewals? And what does it do if the presumption is not statutory, but a reactive alteration of the existing insurance contract? Well, whether it's presumptive or reactive, the actual cost of COVID claims covered by workers' compensation will eventually be included in the rate making data, but not now. And I'll get to that in a moment. I'll give a specific detail for Florida. As most COVID claims have been small in size, as the judge indicated, there are a small segment that are very, could be very large claims, but the majority are small. And I have some new data on that from a national perspective. We don't expect there to be a large disruption in the market for workers' comp coverage, uh, you know, given the current infection rate. And let me give you one example here. In Florida, NCCI, as we know, does the proposed rates for Florida, and they have proposed the statewide average rate for 2021 to be 5.7% less than what it is now. So 5.7% decrease, and that continues a trend of annual decreases in Florida. And the quick answer is they look at rates from historical perspectives. They don't react to a current situation and they just don't have enough data right now to make decisions that would incorporate COVID. So once again, it's a longer term situation, not a short term. And we're gonna see similar rate actions across the country. You know, many states are also in the process now of their rate making for 2021. Uh, but let me give you some information from a recent report that Marsh put out, uh, some interesting observations in their report. Uh, and once again, this looks at it from a national perspective. Many of the most dire predictions about COVID-19's impact of the workers' comp sy systems have not been realized. Uh, claims of COVID-19 exposure in the workplace have been outpaced by the decline in other types of reported occupational injuries. And what they've seen, once again, at the national level, 96% of the cases are less than 3,500. You know, once again, you have that 4% that's very high, but 96% are under 3,500. So nothing dramatic from a national perspective at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and Judge Langham, um, you know, Working from home probably uh, creates its own um, challenges in terms of um, the workers' comp system and, you know, having another place of work. Um, what's Florida's, um, you know, position on um, if a claim happens working from home, is that a covered loss? Um, you know, what? How, how is the transition of working from home going to impact the workers' comp system? Uh, I, I think you've got two impacts you need to be worried about. Number one, employers are sending folks home to work in environments that were perhaps not designed for work nor adapted to it. And so ergonomically, uh, environmentally, I think you're putting people to work in areas that may present more risk of injury uh, than the workplace does. The other side of it uh, is that we don't differentiate as to whether a, a work injury occurred at the office or somewhere else. We really only on, under our law ask the question whether it is in the course and scope of employment, that is, were you working at the time and did the injury arise from that work? And we've got a jumble of cases from our appellate court. And frankly, we've got a lot of confusion and it came up mostly about uh, 18 months to two years ago in a case involving a claims adjuster working in Arizona who had a home office that was approved by her employer. And she came downstairs about five o'clock in the morning because uh, though she was in Arizona, 
Arizona. She was working in Florida and she came down to take a break and get a cup of coffee and tripped over the family dog and injured herself. And our first district court of appeal issued a decision that uh, frankly, there's a lot of disagreement about as to whether that should or should not have been workers' comp. And I think most of us before that decision thought that that would be workers' comp the same way that you left your workstation in the office and tripped over something that had nothing to do with the job still would work under what we called the personal comfort doctrine. The First District Court of Appeal concluded that that trip over the dog did not arise out of that adjuster's employment. And so it was denied and no benefits collected. So I think from that standpoint, this telecommuting is going to have some impact. I think there's going to be more, uh, more of an inclination to litigate it. And folks are going to be asking these questions because I think we're going to see more of these injuries at home, whether they're repetitive trauma in terms of the ergonomics or whether they're just risks that are presented where folks have a trip and fall or something like that. So I see litigation on the horizon, and I think it's going to take a while for us to sort this out and get a better clarity from our court about what is or isn't compensable. Interesting. And I remember that case very well and kind of chuckled over the dog situation, even though, unfortunately, you know, somebody was hurt. Um, shifting gears, um, this question is for Aaron. And I'd like to, you know, talk about business interruption insurance for a little bit. Um, you know, business interruption has an exclusion in place for uh, bacteria and viruses. And there's been a lot of media attention around this issue. Um, what is business interruption insurance for one? And second, what, um, why, why is there this exclusion in place? Um, so to start with uh, what business interruption is, uh, it is a component of a commercial policy. Uh, it's a voluntary component of a commercial policy in most cases. It doesn't have a huge take up rate uh, in the United States. Uh, what it is, is it's based on uh, there being a physical loss in the, in the commercial enterprise and uh, helping to plug the gap in income uh, during that shutdown, that physical shutdown. Classic example would be, uh, you know, a kitchen fire in a restaurant. Um, so again, not something that a lot of people uh, employ as part of their commercial policy or have uh, traditionally. Um, in terms of the relevance and why this has become a conversation in COVID-19, uh, there are some policies that uh, do have a spelled out exclusion to uh, bacteria and virus. But again, um, all BI policies that I'm aware of uh, start with the concept of a physical loss trigger. Uh, so um, it, it, is, it works both ways, I guess, is, is the way to, to articulate that. The reason why uh, business interruption doesn't cover uh, pandemic uh, virus and bacteria is it's a, again, an ordinary disease of life. And it is when you're talking about a pandemic and onset, the basis of insurance is that you have to be able to spread a risk in order to sustain the loss. And there is absolutely no way to create a pool where you could spread the risk sufficiently when you're talking about something that hits everywhere, everyone, all at the same time. Um, it's completely contrary uh, and therefore uninsurable. Uh, so that's why uh, that, that coverage works the way that it does. Um, there are a couple of very, you know, you may hear mentioned in the news, very few, uh, it, ex, uh, it, what, what, what am I trying to say? There, there are um, a couple of examples of very, very high end, usually event oriented policies that costs uh, extraordinary amounts of money that try to address some issues like this, either terrorist attack or pandemic. Um, and you're usually talking about things like the Olympics or, or Wimbledon or something like that. Nothing that um, would ever be on a size and scale uh, that would apply to general businesses uh, in America or, or elsewhere. Thank you for that explan explanation, Aaron. And, you know, I know that there's been um, a lot of lawsuits related to um, business interruption insurance. And of note um, are, you know, the large big name restaurant chefs that have teamed up with a trial lawyer from Louisiana to create this, you know, movement, if you will. 
Um, Mark, can you uh, talk a little bit about how these lawsuits are playing out in the courts? Um, you know, obviously this is going to take quite a while for this to all, you know, settle out, but what's, what's currently taking place? So what we've seen so far, there's been 23 court decisions to date in both state and federal courts. Most rulings have been in favor of insurers, uh, proving once again that standard BI policies don't cover COVID-19 shutdowns, uh, that direct physical loss of damage must occur for a claim to be triggered, and government orders do not constitute direct physical loss of damage to property. So that's what we've seen in the rulings that have been in favor of insurers. There's been three of those rulings in Florida courts. Uh, and then there was our, actually our, interesting, a recent North Carolina ruling against the insurer. That's kind of an outlier. Uh, and that's certainly one that's gonna continue on with appeals and it's gonna be a long term process. But the concern we're, we have here is we feel trial attorneys are giving their clients false hope because in most cases, it's very clear cut, this is not going to be covered. And lawsuits are not going to benefit business owners. By the time these cases get settled, uh, whatever direction they go in, if they do continue on and a judge allows it to move forward to trial, doesn't dismiss the case before trial, the business owners are not going to see that money. You know, it, the trial attorneys are going to make a lot of money. <laughs> the business Owners are not, and if there is a ruling in their favor, eventually, they're probably not going to be in business anymore to favor from that ruling. So it's really false. So I'm going to quote somebody here, Sherman Joyce, president of the American Tort Reform Association. He wrote a recent op-ed. He in it, Just a couple great comments here. Many trial attorneys are seeking to capitalize on the pandemic crisis and judicial system for their own financial gain. Plaintiffs simply don't have the law on their side. Business interruption insurance has generally been understood to protect against losses by physical destruction or property loss. And the most important point he made was forcing insurers to cover COVID-19 business interruption claims will be detrimental to the insurance industry, which is a backbone of the U.S. economy. And that's important because if insurers were forced to pay out on coverage that they did not charge policyholders for, no premium was paid for this coverage, that would wipe out the industry surplus in just a few months. And right now we're at about 826 billion. That's the latest data we have uh, through mid-year. There'd be no money left to pay claims that you paid your premium for. So here we are in hurricane season. We've seen all these big storms, wildfires in California. That's what the policyholders paid for. That's the coverage they expect. If you bought a business interruption coverage in Florida and there's a hurricane, you expect that to be paid when you have a loss from a hurricane. The money won't be there if it's wiped out by decisions that would force insurers to pay. Um, this question is for William and Judge Langham. We've talked about some pretty significant changes that are occurring through legislation and regulation across the country, but generally insurance is a contract between two parties. What are the legal implications here? I think, Carolyn, these business interruption claims are very clear to me that there is no coverage. And I'm willing to wait to see our courts dispose of these claims over the next year or so and wait for that body of case law to develop that, in fact, there's no coverage. Some folks have come to us about a potential legislative solution on that issue, but as we looked at it, it's really clear there isn't coverage for these cases. Instead, what we've wanted to do is focused on tort liability issues and COVID-19 liability issues because the business interruption issues, that's black letter law, that's the terms of the contract, and if you read these contracts, there simply is no coverage. I and the Institute we're advocating don't address that issue legislatively, let it work its way up through the court system. And there's not gonna be uh, coverage on those claims because the contracts are very clear. And, and Carolyn, one of the things that concerns me about this is that the decisions that, that William's talking about, I don't necessarily disagree with him, but unfortunately uh, we see those things take uh, a great deal of time. And, uh, and a lot of these issues, I'm afraid, are going to have to percolate up to appellate courts 
And I think in the meantime, a lot of money is going to be spent on lawyers and legal fees and discovery uh, to get to those answers. And I don't think it's just with the business interruption insurance. I, I think it's with workers' comp as well. It's, to me, the same sort of impairment of contract when you see regulators and others step in uh, in, in place of legislative bodies and without debate or discussion, change the burden of proof or change the compensability under workers' compensation. Uh, I don't see it as any different. Those workers' comp policies were written to cover a certain spectrum of risks, to charge a price that was commensurate with the risk being assumed. And now uh, through fiat, we're stepping in uh, in the various states and we're creating additional liability for those carriers in order to compensate folks who may or may not have actually contracted this disease at work. Uh, I get that these folks need some sort of support. I get that they're being as surprised by COVID as anyone is surprised, but I am concerned about the general effect on the market as a whole as we interfere with these contracts that folks have entered into. I think it's, it's got a lot of uh, very serious implications across the board. Aaron, I know you and our NAMIC and some other insurance groups have recommended um, some changes um, if there was a future pandemic. If there was a prospective solution for business interruption insurance, what do you think that um, should look like? Yeah, I, so I, you know, as, as William noted, um, there are a lot of conversations happening in the states and have been happening over the course of the year about trying to do something retroactively. Um, there are also concurrently conversations about doing something prospectively. Uh, again, you know, we have to harken back to the concept of insurability. And uh, for, for those reasons, you know, trying to shift uh, these burdens to uh, any kind of insurance contract, it, it simply won't work. Um, the, the only organization or entity large enough to sustain this kind of loss is the federal government. Uh, so what we have done at NAMIC is join forces with uh, some of our brethren at APCIA and the Big Eye and developed a proposal called the Business Continuity uh, Protection Program. And it's envisioned to be under the treasury and would be a voluntary program that contains um, coverage for businesses that elect it for uh, a certain period of time uh, with, again, a, a, an additional voluntary backstop on top of that. Uh, and it would have a parametric trigger. Uh, and so once a pandemic hits, it's clear cut and then the checks go out. Uh, and so it's meant to be a program uh, that gets uh, business saving money into the hands of business owners as soon as possible uh, and appropriately uh, has the federal, uh, the federal government as the involving entity. It also has some protections in it uh, some clawback programs uh, to try to eliminate and, and reduce fraud within the program. We, we think it's a, it's a great approach. We're looking forward uh, to hopefully Congress taking it up soon. Uh, but, but we think um, no matter what the solutions are, they have to be at the federal level and they're gonna have to be collaborative. Uh, in the BCPP, we uh, envision the distribution channel being through agents and brokers. Uh, and so we think that kind of um, that kind of partnership is appropriate, and uh, we think that as these conversations uh, work themselves out in Washington, uh, we're hopeful the BCPP will sort of emerge as the one that makes the most sense. And, and building on that, on November nineteenth, the U.S. House Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance is holding a virtual hearing called "Insuring Against a Pandemic: Challenges and Solutions for Policyholders and Insurers." So we're hoping. This is a step in the right direction to uh, governmental solutions on this issue. William, there's been several quotes in the media from plaintiff's attorneys claiming that reforms aren't needed because exposure is already really hard to prove. How do we combat that narrative and why are liability protections necessary? Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Well, what we're seeing is cases are being filed and I have approximately in my office 35 of those cases. And those cases right now, the themes in Florida are, they're directed primarily at nursing home claims. There's a lot of cruise line claims. And likewise, I've pulled cases from other states in anticipation of the type of cases that we're gonna see in Florida. So the cases are being filed. And as a result, in order to get our business community back to work, 
we need to address COVID-19 liability reform in Florida. One thing that I think is important to also note is that several other states have addressed this. The Florida legislature was meeting during the middle of March, and that's kind of the time frame where the public really understood what was going on with COVID, because that's on March 12th when the NBA canceled their season. Well, that happened to be the last week that the Florida legislature was in session. But several other states like North Carolina, Nevada, and others address these issues. So all these states are doing this for a reason. They have evidence of lawsuits and we have evidence of those lawsuits in Florida as well. So it, this is a very important part of getting the business community back to work and opening their doors. And that's why we need COVID-19 uh, liability legislation passed in Florida in short order, hopefully. So William, if I could add to that and, and agree with you, I, I think not only are all those things true, but there's also signaling of things to come. You know, out west in, uh, in the Midwest and Wisconsin, we're seeing things like the Department of Health announcing that they're gonna release a list of every business in the state that has had a positive COVID-19 test. It doesn't take long to figure out who's requested that list and what they're gonna do with it. Um, so uh, absolutely echo everything you said uh, and that these, these protections are necessary and they need to come. And you know, I wanna add on to that. While we agree that governmental solutions here would be ideal, we recommend to small business owners don't assume you're gonna be covered by a federal or state regulation, state, new state laws. Get liability coverage. Make sure your business owner's coverage also includes liability. You wanna be as protected as you can because you know William talked about some of the large cases, the cruise lines, things of that nature. The small business owner, the main street business, they need to think of it in a little different terms and talk to your insurance agent make sure you have liability coverage as part of your business owner's package. Well, and talking about things to come, you know, I've noticed that some of the um, largest uh, plaintiffs attorneys in the state have uh, set up um, COVID-19 shops. And so, you know, on one hand, you can't say that, um, you know, reforms aren't necessary, but then on the other, start setting up shops to make money off of it. So, um, you know, thought that was interesting. So, you know, uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell um, has made liability protections one of his, you know, top priorities going into um, the fourth, you know, round of COVID-19 stimulus discussions. Um, some believe um, in the Florida legislature that if COVID-19 reforms happened, at the federal level in terms of liability protections, the state of Florida wouldn't need to um, pass anything. Uh, why is that incorrect? And anyone who wants to jump in is welcome to. Yeah, I, I can. I, I think that's putting a lot of eggs in one basket, to be honest. Um, I think that we have a lot of shifting dynamics at the moment, and I can mention some of them, but in terms of the shield itself, uh, NAMIC was one of the founding entities of Job Shield America group talking, you know, multi uh, in industry effort to try to have this conversation in Washington at that level. Uh, when there were strong indications of there being another relief package, certainly uh, McConnell indicated that uh, if a package goes through him, it's going to have to contain um, this provision. And certainly that's great news to hear. But the, the elephant in the room there is we haven't seen that, that package uh, and whether or not we will see that package with the backdrop of the election uh, and as things move forward in the next couple of, of months uh, is just unclear. Uh, and the less clear it becomes, the less likely it becomes. Um, so I think that the, um, the responsible thing to do is for the states themselves uh, to have this conversation, look at these options, and to Mark's point, for every business owner to look at their bot policy and make sure that they have uh, coverages in place as well. William, you mentioned earlier that uh, several other states have passed liability protections for COVID-19. 
What are we seeing that other states have done on liability protections and what do you recommend for Florida? Yeah, the other states seem to be focusing on um, three main issues. In other words, these three issues I'm about to speak about are virtually in every bill, even though there's some other issues. One is a uh, heightened evidentiary standard, making the claims like a clear and convincing standard in order to prove causation. Other themes that we're seeing is a uh, heightened culpability standard so that it's raising up from mere negligence to gross negligence. And we see the other states trying to shorten the statute of limitations when you can bring these claims. Um, so in Florida, potentially we could shorten the statute of limitations for these claims from four years to one year. And that would help the business community open up their doors. Now, every other state does have some other items in their bills, but those main themes are things that we saw in other states. And we're trying to uh, bring that to Florida, educate lawmakers that those are some things that can be addressed in Florida as well. Great, thank you. And I look forward to charging the halls with you on that issue um, during the upcoming legislative session. Um, we're almost out of time, but I did want to ask, you know, one more question. Are there any other trends that you're either seeing or concerned about now that we've seen the impact that COVID-19 is having on the insurance marketplace? Well, one interesting trend that's kind of surprised us is on the residential side, homeowners business is just booming. Sales of homes are just off the scale, setting records every month. It, incredible growth, especially here in Florida. We're seeing tremendous growth of home sales here in Florida. And of course, that leads to new policies being written. So for Florida carriers, Florida agents, it's been a very positive trend to see that happen. The only thing I would add to that is just, um, you know, we need to continue to be diligent and recognize that we don't know uh, what all of the impacts of COVID-19 are. You know, at the start of the pandemic, there were a lot of assumptions uh, about what was going to happen uh, in the market or in driver behavior or in outcomes. Um, you know, Mark mentioned there, there was a distinct uh, dip in rate of driving. But what we've seen is a huge spike in severity uh, and deaths on the highways, aggressive driving behavior. Um, so I think we have to be cognizant um, that just because uh, we are quarantining and in a pandemic, it doesn't remove uh, risk. And so we all have to be uh, diligent in that respect. Any final thoughts before we conclude today's panel? Carolyn, I, I would just jump in and, and and suggest that none of us a year ago, I think really appreciated uh, the potential of this thing. And I'm hopeful that perhaps we've, we've learned some lessons. Maybe, maybe we could do some thinking and some barn brainstorming about what other risks are out there that might, might uh, be in our future that we might need to face. And what could we do on a more global basis to get ourselves mentally and otherwise prepared for things that we just haven't been thinking about. I want to go ahead and thank the panelists for being here today and for their time discussing these important issues.